sessions that we have planned, you'll understand this a little bit more. And on this philosophical level, I think a lot of us here, we're taking responsibility for our own existence and that of our children. So it's much bigger than just organic gardening, right? Most people come to permaculture through organic gardening, but it encompasses something much greater than that. So permaculture argues ecological crises, they're crises of systems, right? Ecological, social, political, and moral systems, and there's no single blanket solution or new technology. So what is happening a, a lot he, out in the world right now is we see these ecological crises and we think there's a blanket solution. Let's tech up something. Let's, you know, let's say alternative energy for this whole area. But there's no single blanket solution for the entire world, right? That's because we're all about regional. We're all about cultural. We're all about understanding our climate. And that's what permaculture asks us to do. So it's all about systems thinking, about looking at patterns, relationships, and flows, and working with natural systems that fit the local conditions, the terrain, and the culture. So what's happened with industrial agriculture is that we are not necessarily paying attention to our place. And what's happened in our culture in general is we aren't paying attention to our place. So that's what permaculture asks us to do, is like Cindy and Steve are doing, they're taking a relationship to this place and knowing fundamentally what this place is about. And that's part of what we'll go through in the sessions and that's part of that design practicum. What's around here? What's the soil doing? You know, how was this all created? Knowing your place and then knowing your culture. Understanding who you live near, who your neighbors are. What's the politics in the region? All of that is part of this system. So permaculture is now a worldwide movement, right? There are design courses. There's a 72 hour, two week long, typically, permaculture design course that you can take. And there are design courses all around the world. We had one in Montana um, a couple years ago uh, in Bozeman. So it's become this worldwide movement and it's, it's not this top-down approach. It's all these people in all these different parts of the world working quietly on their own little revolution. So it's drawing from all sorts of different disciplines, right? So permaculture teaches us how to grow our own food in terms of annual gardens or in terms of food forests, how to capture solar energy with your greenhouses or with solar panels, how to capture the wind energy, um, how to create kind of a resilient system. So it's drawing from all sorts of dis different disciplines. And it basically means we're trying to build more self-reliance, we're trying to reduce our ecological footprint, we're trying to increase our resilience, and we're trying to relocalize our economies. So everything that we did, you know, the boon of industrial agriculture and all the mechanization that happened, what's happening now is permaculture is looking back at that, seeing this, that that's all out of scale, right? It's led to a lot of the problems that we're doing, dealing with now. How can we relocalize and come back to something that is smaller scale that makes sense for the community that we live in, that makes sense for the site that we're on? You can also view it as a wardrobe. So permaculture is the framework or the toolbox. And you have all sorts of different disciplines that you can draw on, different strategies and techniques that you can draw on. So you have gray water systems, you have composting toilets, you have passive solar design, you have annual gardens, you have perennial gardens. And you take out and you put on what you need depending on the climate, depending on the culture, depending on the country that you're in. You don't use them all at once. You don't put all of your clothes on <laughs> at once, right? You have to understand when you put that special hat on, when you, you know, put that skirt on or those pants or that, that jacket. So you don't put all, you don't take all of the different elements of permaculture, all the different techniques and just try them all out 
in one area. It just depends on your site. It depends on your soil. It depends on your climate. So like LeRae was, LeRae, right? was saying, you know, this, the, the tropics wasn't really connecting with you because you don't live in the tropics. And so that you have no point of reference for that. So while those techniques work in the tropics, they may not work in a temperate, cold climate zone. So permaculture is guided by three ethics. One of them is care of the earth. Uh, we are doing this, right? We're wanting to care for all living things. You know, that every living thing has an intrinsic value. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we're practicing permaculture is because we want to care for the earth, for the slough that's out there, for the, the river, for the flathead, for the, the soil, for the microorganisms in the soil, for the insects, for the birds, for the deer, for the bears. People care that we are doing this to figure out how we can stay <laughs> on this planet, right? We are doing this to care for ourselves as well, to give ourselves food, to give ourselves shelter, to give ourselves um, clothing, to give ourselves community. And then the third ethic is fair share. It's also known as limits aware. So this is all about sharing our surplus. And that if we do have a surplus, we feed it back into the two, the first two ethics. So an example of that would be if I have a surplus of manure, I use it in a sheet mulching project or in compost and I feed it back into the soil. If I have a surplus of veggies, I give them to my neighbors. If I have a surplus of time, I help my neighbor in their garden. You know? And again, this is a fair share example. You know, Cindy and Steve putting this on to be like, we have this land, we have this place, we want to offer this information to people on a donation based on a donation basis. This is a fair share type of thing, and in return, we're going to create this community and this network of people and more people that can come away and spread permaculture to their friends and family and community. And then permaculture has a set of principles. Now, there are, like any field, there are different principles, but I'm going to teach you the ones that David Holmgren came up with in his uh, principles and pathways beyond sustainability. So the first principle is observe and interact. So we are a hyper-stimulated society right now with our digital phones and our computers and all of that kind of stuff, right? And one of the main and the, the most important principle in permaculture is this whole idea of observing and interacting. Slowing down, taking time, and observing your site. Because there are all sorts of patterns on your site. You know, where is the wind coming from most often? Where do the leaves collect? Where is the snow collecting? Where is the sun sector? Where is it in the summer? Where is it in the winter? Where are the more wetter areas of your property? The more dry areas? Where do you like to hang out in the morning? Where do you never hang out on your property? All of those things are fundamental to a permaculture design. And what they're asking you to do is to slow down and to observe. And more than that, they're also asking, rather than being like, what can I do with this land? You know, what can I do with this land? What does this, how can I manipulate this land to make it do what I want it to do? Right? Permaculture asks us to say, what does this land have to give if I cooperate with it? So that's the difference that we want to make. What does this land want to do? You know, rather than trying to drain away a, a moist area of your property, is that where a pond should go? Or is that where water-loving plants should go? Right? harmonizing with the pattern that you see on that landscape. So that's the first principle. And inherent in that first principle, in this observation, is this idea that the problem is the solution. 
So Bill Mollison, you know, one of the co-originators, liked to use the, the example, it's not that there are too many slugs in your garden, it's that there aren't enough ducks. <laughs> right? So inherent in the problem that you see, there is a solution. I like to think of, it's not that there are too many lawns in suburbia, it's that there aren't enough gardens. So looking at what you think are problems on your landscape and actually trying to see whether in that problem there is a solution that you can find. And so the example I also like to give is when I first moved to Bozeman and we were at this rental property and there's all sorts of stuff that renters had put into storage and we were wanting to use the garage and there's all this junk in there. And there is this box that was one of those, you know, when you go into a store and maybe seed packets or something are hanging on a, a little thing that you turn around. You know, I don't even know what those things are called. Carousel. Carousel. And so I tried to take it to the thrift store and the thrift store's like, we don't want your junk. <laughs> I'm like, but I don't want to throw this away. And when I moved to Bozeman, everyone's like, don't even bother trying to grow tomatoes. It's just not going to work. You know, it's just a big pain in the butt and it's so cold, la, la, la. So we took the, this is, this is that carousel, turned into a hoop house. And the base of it, we turned that around and made that into a bird bath. And that year, I grew all sorts of tomatoes in this, what had been a problem. You know, something that we had thought was just a bunch of junk. And we made this hoop house and grew all these tomatoes. So that's kind of the way that you want to approach what you may see as problems on your site. So the second principle is catch and store energy. So on a site like this, there's all sorts of free energy that's coming onto the site. You know, the sun and the wind and the rain. What you want to do is figure out ways in which to capture that energy and run it through your property for as long as possible before it exits your site. So in this example, how are we catching and storing energy? Solar panels? Passive solar? The landscape wall. The landscape wall, right. That's absorbing heat during the day from the sun, radiating it out at night, awesome. How else are we, pardon me? The plants. Right. The plants are capturing and storing that energy. Windows. The windows. Right. So on all these ways on this one site, this is David Holmgren's site in Australia, you're capturing and storing energy. Trees, of course, are one of the best ways to capture and store energy on your site. Saving seed. So you grow the plant, then you save the seed, you're capturing and storing that energy. And then third principle is you want to obtain a yield. So in permaculture, you're not ever putting in something just because it's pretty. You're not talking about just ornamental plantings. You want to obtain a yield of some kind. Uh, so you're either, you're obtaining a yield of food, you're obtaining a yield of medicine, you're obtaining a yield of attracting beneficial insects, you're obtaining right now, we're obtaining a yield of more people that know about permaculture. So you want to put things in your system, design elements in your system that obtain some sort of yield. And then, because we live in a cold climate, we want to extend that yield in time. So last night when I arrived, I was geeking out, as only other gardeners can do, looking at Cindy's pantry, where she's got applesauce, and she's got jams, and she's got tomato sauce and salsa that's going to take her into, how, how long do those last? In, until the next harvest. Until the next harvest. Awesome. So in cold climates, you want to figure out ways to preserve your yield because we can't grow for 12 months of the year. You know, we can usually maybe grow for six or, you know, maybe with Jerome's green, greenhouses, you can grow for eight, maybe, but, you know. Twelve. Well, <laughs> Darn it, Jerome! <laughs> right, right, yeah, exactly. So, so you, but most often, for most of us, 
it's, yeah, exactly. It's three to four months outside. So we want to figure out how we can extend that yield. So you're either canning or you're dehydrating or you're fermenting or you're freezing your yield. Fourth principle, I think it is, is self-regulate and accept feedback. So the whole idea here is, right, you're observing and interacting with nature. You're maybe putting systems in and they may or may not work. You're accepting the feedback. You're changing things up and you're trying again. So the reason we are in the, you know, some of the issues that we're having today, ecological crises, is that we're not accepting the feedback. We're like, this is the way, we're not going to change, we're just going to keep on doing what we're doing. Right? So when you start to garden, like if you plant tomatoes in this spot and every year after year you don't get tomatoes, eventually you're going to change where you put the tomatoes. Well, you should, right? Or you're like, the soil needs to be improved in some way. So there's a, there's a dynamic that's happening. These systems are not static. There's a constant dynamic that's happening. And I can tell you that on our property six years ago when I came there, I had certain ideas of where I was going to put everything. And that has shifted over time. And in fact, the, the, the rule of thumb in permaculture is that you should actually spend at least a year observing your site without doing anything. Because the map is not the territory. You can look and say, oh, well, that would go there and that would go there. But you don't know. There are microclimates or other things that you may have not anticipated. So you have to constantly be in that dance. And so the design that I came up with six years ago is not what is in place right now. And there are things that are constantly changing in that space. Another principle, use and value renewable resources. So obviously, we're not trying to continue to use you know, we're trying to lower our ecological footprint, not be as dependent on the fossil fuel industry. So we're using wind, we're using sun, we're using animal systems. So using goats potentially, or this is a chicken tractor here, having animals do some of the work for us, we give them a more humane life, we get maybe eggs or meat from them, depending, but they are also renewable resources. And part, animal systems are very much a part of a permaculture system, or can be. Produce no waste. We're trying to create on our properties closed loop systems as much as possible. Right? So we're composting, and we're feeding that back into the system. We're trying not to export things off the property. So I, I love how in our cities, right, on the level of design, we're raking all our leaves to the side of the road and the city picks them up and takes them away and then we buy mulch. <laughs> same thing, not as pretty, but same thing. So, you know, thinking about not exporting. So I always recommend to my clients to keep all of that, keep those leaves. That's carbon matter that you can use to build your compost piles, to sheet mulch, to mulch your garden beds. All of that material is a resource. Uh, and so I'm the crazy lady who goes around town and picks up all of that material from the side of the road because I need more on my property. So at a city-wide level, I'm feeding it back into the system. I'm creating a closed loop system. But a lot of that, again, is dumb design, right, in terms of exporting stuff off and bringing stuff back on again. So when the needs of a system are not met from within, we pay the price in energy and pollution. So that's that whole idea, that if you're not working with that principle of produce no waste, you suddenly have liability issues, right? So a factory farm like this, the manure, is a huge liability massive amount of waste, right? But if you designed it right and scaled it down, that waste becomes a resource that feeds the grass, that feeds the cows. So it becomes a cyclical system, but it's about design. I have so many gardeners who come to my workshop who are like, do you know where I can get some manure? You know, so there's a way to design the system 
where this waste could be a resource, but we haven't designed it correctly. And so this just becomes these giant pools of not great stuff. So next principle, design from patterns to details. So again, this is that idea of observation, right? You're understanding the patterns on your site before you get into the details of where exactly you're going to put your vegetable garden. So what we're doing this weekend is this evening, I'm presenting the overarching patterns of permaculture, the ethics and the principles and the social systems design. Tomorrow, we're going to get into the details of how do you build soil? How do you create a food forest? How do you capture water? But you want to start with the patterns. You want to start with the big picture, the big vision. So when you're designing a site, you always want to start there as well. You want to start with the goals of your property. What do you want? What do you want to do on your site? Because that's going to inform all the details of how you go about it. So you don't want to be like, I want this, 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 and this. Well, that's good, right? But I want the bigger pattern and vision for what you want to create. First, I want to understand what is happening on your site in terms of slope, in terms of sun, in terms of where the wildlife is. I want to understand all of that first before I determine where I'm going to put my vegetable garden, before I determine where I'm going to put my food forest or my greenhouse. Another principle, integrate, don't segregate. So think of your yard as an ecosystem. So we often have a tendency when we're designing that we put our vegetable garden here, flower garden is going to be over here, where the kids play is going to be over here. We segregate in our designs. And permaculture is about integrating the system. Your whole yard is an ecosystem. So you grow, and Cindy has a great example of this. We'll see this tomorrow when we do hands-on activities. You're growing flowers with food. The flowers attract beneficial insects and pollinators. That's what the food needs as well. It's all part of an integrated system. You're creating mini ecosystems on your property, whether it's in your food forest, area, whether it's in your annual garden space, and then you're considering your whole property as that ecosystem. And inherent in this integrate, don't segregate is each element performs multiple functions. So you don't, and an element is something like chickens, or a greenhouse, or a pond, or those are all considered elements in permaculture. So you have an element for multiple reasons. So who, who has, does anybody here have chickens? Right. So why, Shauna, right? Why do you have chickens? I would like to have their eggs, and when they're manure, you can use that in your composting in your garden. Yeah, great. So you have them for the manure, the feathers can go in the compost, the poop can go in the compost, they help scratch up the soil, you have them for the eggs, maybe you have them for meat, so you have them for multiple reasons on your property, not just one reason. And that's what you want to think about with all the elements that you have on your property. Great. Yes. So, so what Jerome's talking about is you need to identify what each element on your property needs and to see whether you can either grow those things or, or get them for free. Again, it's finding what might be somebody else's waste and feeding it back into your system so that it's a resource. Thank you. The slot bucket from the chicken goes out, the kitchen goes out and the feeds them. That's their favorite meal. Yes. So thinking about all the ways in which both identifying what their products are so that you can use those in your system, but then also identifying their needs. So their outputs and their inputs, right? Their outputs, I need to find a place for all of these things, otherwise they'll become a waste in my system. And their inputs, I need to find a way to meet all of these needs, otherwise I'm going to have to import them from okay. elsewhere. So same with the pond that we have on our property, is not just because ponds are cool. <laughs> it's because this creates a whole microclimate, the sun reflects off of it and creates a microclimate where I grow my tomatoes. You're growing aquatic plants, that if you get an overgrowth of algae or or um, lily pads, I take that and add it to my compost pile, or I put the algae directly on the garden bed that's right next door. 
It attracts beneficial insects, it creates wildlife habitat and attracts birds into the system, dragonflies into the system. And then you can grow cattails that you can eat as well. So that pond, and then it captures the way that we fill that pond is from the roof. So it captures water off of the roof and then it overflows. When this overflows, it, the water overflows into the garden. Yeah, so same idea, you're using that element to enhance your zones, but you're also using it as more of a heat sink and the reflection off the pond. So you're kind of breaking down every element into everything that it could possibly do and seeing whether it could help do that. Like going a zone, half a zone, right? You're going half a zone up because of that. Each element performs multiple functions. Each function is supported by multiple elements. So when you're talking about building resilience in your system, you think, okay, what function do I need to serve? I want to harvest water. I can harvest it by having a water tank, by having a rain barrel. I can harvest it by mulching around my plants really well, so that keeps in the soil moisture. I can harvest it by planting a living ground cover that also keeps in the soil moisture rather than just having bare soil. I can harvest it by having a pond. I can harvest it by having swales, which are ditches on contour, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. So if one of these fails, you're still harvesting water. Two of them fail, you're still harvesting water. That's about, that's resilience, right? So in it, if you have adverse conditions, you still have ways in which you are storing water on your site, whether it's in a tank or whether it's actually in the soil. Can we still have number eight integrate? Yes, yes, it's going deep. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now we're on to the next one. So choose small and slow solutions. So again, and this, this area is an example of kind of large scale industrial ag. You know, trying to first choose small and slow solutions. It's better to have small successes than epic failures. You know, in life in general too, right? So it's starting small on your property. And that's what I recommend for people who have never gardened before or have never done this before. Do not put in a giant system because for a lot of us, we're relearning what our parents or grandparents used to do. The whole amount of physical labor that is needed for the maintenance, for the installation, for all of that. You want to grow into your garden. So for a lot of people, I'm like, just put in a four by eight bed. See what happens, see how much time it takes. And then you can, you can always grow. Right? But you don't want to, especially, you don't want to open up all sorts of soil and then have to plant it all and maintain it all. And, you know, in July you walk away because it's way too much work. So being realistic about what I see. I see Shauna laughing back there. It's huge. <laughs> it's already there. It's a huge garden. Right. Right. And it's kind of overwhelming. Well, yeah. Right? There's nothing there right now. Yeah. Yeah. So starting small with your, so you could, what you want to do is you want to have a big vision in terms of your design. Yeah. So for clients, or it doesn't have to be a big vision, but for example, I'll give clients a design. This is what you can do, and then a timeline for implementation that usually involves at least five years, right? What I've seen, how I've seen projects fail is that they put all sorts of capital in at first, and we'll talk about this later, and then they don't know how to maintain it all. Or then you have to pay someone 20 hours a week in perpetuity <laughs> to maintain your property because you can't do it yourself. So just thinking about small and slow solutions and also this whole bigger idea that our agriculture has gotten out of scale, our economy has gotten out of scale, our banking system has gotten out of scale, our cities have gotten out of scale. We need to relocalize and bring things back to small. Use and value diversity. So right now, in general, only 20 plant species make up 90% of the human diet. That is not resilient. That is what you would call a very fragile system. So in our gardens and on our properties, what we're trying to do is build diversity. So 
Jerome, do you know offhand how many different species of plants do you grow? Right, yeah. So you're growing different species of plants, and then within those species, you're growing different varieties. So, for example, I, I'll put in, you know, tomatoes and cucumbers and zucchini and la la la, but I'll have seven different varieties of tomatoes or four different varieties of peppers because of those seven, like one of the seven this year for some reason got blossom and rot. No problem. The rest were fine. So you want to build resilience on all sorts of different levels because some things might work some season and some things might not. Or when you put in fruit trees, putting in different varieties of, you know, you have apples, pears, plums, cherries, whatever, but you're trying different varieties of those. There's maybe an Evans Bali cherry and a Meteor cherry or a Macintosh apple and a Norland apple and a State Fair or a Sweet 16. You're wanting to build that diversity into okay. your I system. Said your cherry season for two and, a half, two, two and a half months rather than two weeks. Right. So if you have three or four varieties of cherries uh, and you're placed in different microclimates, you keep picking cherries all the time. And the same with apricots. You have 20, 20 apricot trees, you've got apricots for three months. Brilliant. Instead of two weeks. And that's, that's the whole two, what you're doing, what Jerome is doing there is he's using and valuing diversity, he's obtaining a yield, and he's extending that yield in time. So encompassing three principles. And here, especially, we want to be experimenting. Another thing, too, as the climate is changing, right, the recommendation is that you put things in your system that are also, you know, that might be zone three. Well, here it's zone four, five. So you may be putting things in that are zone six, two. Or you could try, right? You could start to stack your system anticipating that the climate is warming or depending on what it's, I mean, Montana, they suspect it will be longer, wetter winters and hot and drier summers. So we have to start designing for that. Next principle, optimizing edge. The edge is where the action is, is the, um, the, the idea. So you could put a round pond in, and that would be fine. But if you start to create more edges, that pond, all of a sudden, there's different habitat, right? That's a very different habitat here than this here, right? So you start to create these little micro habitats where different things can exist. And so that's the idea about creating possible edge. And what happens is, say, here's a grassland system and a forest system, right? There are five grassland species, five forest species, five species that live along the edge, but also the ones from the grassland and the forest also live along that edge. Who fishes? Where do you fish? Where do you get fish? And where do you fish in the river? Right. So along kind of the edges. Sometimes? Maybe? Right. Yeah, because that's where the food is, that's where the fish hang out, that's where it's most productive. Uh, so the same idea is kind of consider the edges on your property and how to either enhance them or optimize them. Well, for example, there are some edges that you don't want. Maybe when you're going, if you surround a, a bed, right, with a bunch of river rock, where do the weeds <laughs> accumulate? along the edges, you know, where the moisture is, right? Can you take advantage of that in some way? Possibly, right? So just being aware of the edges and optimizing them where you want them and maybe minimizing them where you don't. So, and, and thinking about the edge of, so for example, if you establish a food forest, right, and each tree has a little tree mulch around it. You know, each tree and shrub has a bunch of mulch around it. Is that making sense to people? So if you have a food forest area like this, and then you have little shrubs here, 
you have an edge around here, a mulched edge around here, and a mulched edge around here, and a mulched edge, all of these edges you have to maintain. So it's probably better if you just create one big edge there so that you're maintaining that rather than all these little edges. Last principle, respond to change. So this is that whole idea, right, of forests and natural systems, at least in the past, have been able to be resilient and respond to change, respond to adverse conditions. And so that's what we're trying to create on our properties as well. We're seeing more fragile systems right now because the ecosystems are really being tested. So part of our challenge, right, as people who want to regenerate land, as people who want to regenerate ecosystems, is to understand the science, obviously, behind how this happens and to usher all of this along. How can we create resilient systems that are able to respond to change, are able to deal with adverse conditions? And that's, if you follow a lot of the permaculture principles, that's how you do that, by creating elements that perform multiple functions, that have functions that, um, that are supported by multiple elements, by creating more resilience, by planting diversity into your system. So all of those are ways in which you want to be able to creatively use and respond to that change in your system. So permaculture means working with rather than against nature. I should say natural systems because we are nature working as well. But we're working with, we're harmonizing with the patterns that we see rather than fighting against them and making them do something that they don't want to do. It's applying the principles of natural systems, mimicking those, protracted and thoughtful observation, Bill Mollison liked to say, rather than protracted and thoughtless labor. How many of you have digged, dug holes that you've had to fill back in again <laughs> because you didn't want to put the thing, you decided you didn't want to put that where it was supposed to be? I've done that many times. Looking at systems and people in all of their functions as well um, that, you know, like the pond, right, can have all sorts of different functions. We as people do all sorts of different things as well, right? We help on the land, we create community, we create, um, uh, we cook food, we're in the garden, so we have different functions that we also serve on the property too. And this is this whole idea too. What we're doing in permaculture systems is we're shifting from fire to flow. So what do I mean by that? We're shifting from burning oil, gas, and coal to capturing flows of energy from the sun, wind, water in renewable ways to passive solar homes, greenhouses, solar panels, solar hot water, right? Building rainwater catchment systems, rain gardens and swales, and we'll cover that tomorrow, wind turbines, and geothermal heat. So we're going from this fossil fuel, heavily based system to more of a flow of capturing all of this energy that comes onto our site. And this is where we want to go. So Rosemary Morrow, who's a, a well-known uh, permaculture teacher, I, I took, took my teacher training with her, and she wrote the book Earth User's Guide to Permaculture, which is a great kind of very basic introduction to permaculture that I would recommend. But when I think about the food I need for the day, my mind goes to what's growing in the garden and not what is stashed in the refrigerator. So fundamentally, what we're trying to work back towards in our culture is that. This means you're connected to the natural world. This means that you know where your food comes from. This means that you have an understanding of the land and you're taking stewardship of the land. All of that is encompassed in that, and that's where permaculture kind of directs people. So one thing that you can do is, um, and Jerome, if you have ideas too, is you can look at the sun on the, what is it, equinox? 
and at 9, 12, and 3, and see if you have, so that's six hours, right? You want, full sun is eight hours of sun a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so ideally you get eight. And one thing that you can do too is if you don't, if you still don't fully know, I mean it's about observation. It's about spending time on your site, observing it through the seasons as well to see how much sun hits. Also, if you're thinking about a spot where you want to put something that needs full sun, you know, take a garden hose or something and put it out there so you understand and you can always look at the exact same spot to see whether you have enough sun. So that's an option, but really, for your site especially, I would pay close attention to the sun and shade pattern. I mean, you're always wanting to pay a close attention, but because you have limited space, I'd spend a lot of time looking at that and mapping that out before you plant. And then you could always plant annuals to begin with for one season to see if they get, you know, put a tomato in there, see if it gets enough sun, if it goes to maturity. And if it does, great, you know you probably have enough full sun. If it doesn't, or if it's really struggling, then I mean, that's also you got to get to your soil because there's pine trees and so these things. So, yeah, that's something that we can talk about kind of individually in terms of your particular site. This whole weekend is going to culminate with Sunday where we're going to do a design practicum. So the, the whole idea here is that you're going to collect all this information and understanding, which you can apply to your property. But, then you, but what we're going to do is we're going to actually design, help design, and come up with designs for both this property, something beautiful, and then Two Hoots, which is where Cindy and Steve live that's just down the road. And so we'll get to know a little bit more about those sites over the next day or so, so that we can gather all that information and come up with a design. So we'll divide you all into groups, and two groups will focus on this property, and two groups are going to focus on Two Hoots. But I'm going to go over some of the ways in which we start to approach this. So we know the principles, we know the ethics, right? We might know kind of the larger vision of our property. Now, how do we, how do, we do this? How do we come up with where we're going to put stuff, right? So the first thing, oh, that, that was weird, sorry, is that we want to map where everything is, and then we're going to go over these different ways that you can approach design. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to create a base map. So for those of you who have a property, you want to know what you have. And so that means that you want to have your property lines on there. You want to put critical site features on there, obviously, your buildings, your house, your sheds, your walkways, clotheslines. If you are on septic, the drain field is huge. You need to know where that is because you don't want to grow on the drain field. You want to know where your well is, again, very important. Irrigation lines, gas lines, call before you dig, dog run, existing trees. You want to know what you have. So you want to create some sort of base map. So right now, this is where we are. We're sitting right here. So this is the Something Beautiful property. So those are the property lines. We have the maps here on site. So this is where you're getting a sense of, okay, here's the property line, here's the house. There are all sorts of different outbuildings on this site, and we'll get a, we'll, we're going to be going outside here in just a little bit. Um, there are all, all sorts of outbuildings, so you want to be aware of those. You want to be aware of the driveway. I don't know if we know where the gas lines are. Right. Um, there is no dog run, but there is a fence that goes around this small area of the property. Um, do we know where the... Ah, yeah. Uh, is there a drain field? Or do you know where the drain field is? Yes, out back. Okay. There's geothermal loop field somewhere. Okay, so all of that stuff you want to be aware of because that's going to put limitations on your design in terms of where you put what. So you're going to come up with a base map of your property. So that's the first step. The second step is you're going to then start to observe what's going on on your property. So once you have that base map, you're going to observe what's, what's happening. So what I want you to do is turn to page five. 
of your handouts, and it's called Observation Checklist. What I want you to do is get into groups of three groups of three, <laughs> of three or four. Get into groups of three or four. I encourage you to, I know there's some people that know one another, I encourage you to go with people that you don't know. First one I want you to do is, as individuals, I want you to go outside and address these questions. What do you feel from this place? What strikes you right away? And let your mind water and see what information you are offered. So that's the first thing that I want you, to do, want you to do on an individual basis. Then I want you to group up. We'll, we'll create our groups in here, but then you'll go out, do your little intuition thing, and then group up. And the Earth folks, you want to address these questions. The Air folks, you want to address your questions. Water folks, does that make sense? And then we're going to come back and convene, and you're going to report back. Now, some of this information you will not know, unless Cindy is in your group. But if you don't know it, don't stress out. We'll just have Cindy kind of fill in some of those gaps. Cindy, do you want to share a little bit about what struck you about this place when you first? Yeah, I, when, we, when I first walked on the property, a lot of it was actually out of curiosity. And then when I, when I walked on, just this, there was this feeling of, of peace, and there's a liveliness to just this site, the, the trees and the house, there's, like it feels happy. Mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, and there was just a very special energy to this place. And, well, <laughs> and so we caught it. <laughs> nice. That's great. So Jenna, Jenna's, Jenna's team would tell us a little, <laughs> tell us a little bit about what you found out. You don't have to answer every single question, but just overall. Well, I'd love some help from my group, too. But, yeah. Um, as I think it was said before, it's a very open land. Mm -hmm. Business area, and it's near water. Can everybody hear Jenna? No. No, open land. Yes. Uh, there's obviously water nearby. Um, Jerome was saying that the soil is quite sandy, actually, unlike nearby areas like Kalispa, which is a more clay-like soil base. Um, a lot of native vegetation around that's obviously been here for a very long time and it's very grown. The health of the vegetation is has a little bit of suffering in some areas, probably just because of the climate um, mm -hmm. and the dryness. Um, what else do we have here? We noticed that there's a lot of wildlife. Mm -hmm. uh, deer, when we first came out, or woodpecker, nice. birds. Pheasants, geese. <laughs> yeah, nice. So a lot of wildlife. And if people get a chance related to the Earth, that very far left map shows that this used to be, it's an oxbow lake. This used to be part. So that's something, and maybe you want to describe, Cindy, more what's going on. So we're, we're right here, right now. Here's the flathead headed down to the Flathead Lake. And this is, you know, this was once part of the Flathead River, and now it's just a little bit of, of water. So this is all, all river bottom. And so you can see from above, you can see the pattern right. you can see actually the of the meander. The river went, yeah, in the, in the, in the ridges and, and valleys. So it's cool to look at. spring are there just kind of wet, marshy areas? There aren't that, it's surprisingly not so much. Oh, okay. Yeah. And how about the mosquitoes? Someone's asking about what are the mosquitoes The mosquitoes like? are not the nearly as intelligent as the ones in the in Wisconsin. <laughs> 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 but, but yes, there are certainly mosquitoes. Okay. Yeah. Nice. How about air? Ryder, were you air? Yeah. yeah. I actually struggled with this a little bit, partially because there's zero wind today. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, it's, I mean, it's hard. It, you know, some of the questions were, you know, how does the wind move through the side of an old You know, how do you anticipate wind need areas? Where are frost pockets? I mean, really would need a context by which to do that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we were able to derive or deduce was typically weather is coming in from this direction. You know, from the from east from or from? Yeah, what was it? Uh, southwest? It's, it's from the southwest. Some, from the southwest. Yeah, so 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and every now and again, we get some strange stuff coming down from Canada or dropping down from the north, and that really throws our typical systems off and can create some intense storms. Mm -hmm. um, with that, you know, as we were looking at that and anticipating it, you know, much of that it's that waterfront that that is exposed to, and there's a lot of older, mature trees, and then a lot of shrubs and bushes and things of that nature. So that provides a buffer. Mm -hmm. um, then you also have that, that forest line right over here yeah. that also kind of comes in from that south. So there's there's things to anticipate, ways to think about this. Snow load, the way snow blows in, mm -hmm. you've got a lot of exposure coming over that water. When that water freezes, you're going to have a lot of snow blowing in. Mm -hmm. You know, things to anticipate. But again, it's, it's hard to do that on a conceptual basis. You need yeah. to see it, you need to experience it. Yeah. We weren't able to. And these are, this is meant as, you know, this is just an exercise for us to start to know the site, but this is stuff that you want to bring, you know, for those of you who have property, this is stuff that this is filled out over time as you spend more time on your site. There are some, you know, climatological data, of course, that you can get and you kind of know the prevailing winds or you know where some of your weather comes from, but there are, like Lorraine was saying, there are all sorts of potentials for microclimate on this site. Um, so you really want to spend some time with it, but you did, you did well with what you had on a zero wind day <laughs> in terms of anticipation. Anything else you want to say about wind or in this area that you've noticed? Well, as far as the, the frost pockets, those down in the swales mm -hmm. tend to be quite a bit colder than the ridge lines. Right. And we'll get frost down there way earlier than you'll get it on the ridge lines. Right. How about water? Uh, who had water? Randy. Yeah. So we get 26 inches of rain. It comes mostly in wow. yeah. uh, December through June. Okay. January and June are actually the wettest months of the year. But, okay. Um, How does the water move through the site? It seemed like, uh, as somebody already mentioned, there's kind of some low areas around the house over there. It seemed like there's a low area coming from that field towards the Mm -hmm. There's an artesian well pouring water right into the slough. Nice. Um, and so it seems to be it would move that direction. Mm -hmm. That's where the water's collecting. But there's also a pond out front in a low area. Right. So that would create some microclimates. Um, and there'd be some microclimates in the groves. I uh, think the ponderosa pine grove, the dug firs, spruce grove. Um, for some microclimates. Cool. We didn't know where the septic yeah. fields were. Which, um, yeah, it's actually out back. Like we thought you said yeah. they're out back. Yeah, it's, it's, and it doesn't seem like there's, it's hard to tell where it is. Is it close to the road? Yeah, it's right right. close to the, the outbuildings? No, it's actually kind of behind the house and then okay. out into this flat area. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So know that for the mapping. Don't dig a big hole. Yeah. Great. Any, anything else, Randy? Oh, we just kind of wondered how much water collects on the surface. Um, somebody already said that you already said, said that it doesn't collect in the spring very much. Um, yeah, those little everything gets muffy in the spring. It, you know, everything gets gets pretty wet. And I haven't been on this site um, really that exploring as much as the other sites. Um, but it does certainly get wet and muddy down in the low spots. Um, those buildings seem like they were right in the low spot, those outbuildings. They, they um, look like it. They um, look like, yeah. yeah, we know that this ridge here is above the five, is above the flood zone. You know, I, I'll bring a flood map hmm. yeah. um, to, tomorrow the next day that we can look at because some of these swales are in the flood zones. So cool. I don't know if that was helpful. Yeah. Holly, were you son? You are son. Um, what for the we do claim that this is the facing the south. Mm -hmm. We do have windows to the south. Um, not a lot of property on mm -hmm. the outside, and also lots of trees to shade the south. Mm -hmm. Although there are a lot of open areas that mm -hmm. are away from the house, so mm -hmm. there's plenty of room to um, utilize the sun. The south side is kind of shaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and we'll talk about that more on Sunday, but knowing where the sun, and then there's that whole, this whole field, right, which is full sun here, right? right? Yeah. Right, that's all full sun, and there's some nice open spots on the, on the uh, north side. That right. That we get a lot of sun in the summer. Right. When the sun's tracking higher. Cool. Now, not much winter sun, right? Right. Well, it's here, well, it's well here, it's just right? general here. Yeah, right. Well, Obviously, in that big field area, there'd yeah. always be, but yeah, in and around the house, you'd get, yeah, you'd be you quite limited. Yeah. Shannon, you had miscellaneous. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, what would you like to share there? Well, I mean, a lot of this stuff we didn't know because, for obvious reasons, yep. um, power lines and directionally challenged are near the garage, <laughs> mm -hmm. going across the land. Mm -hmm. We think there's going to be, it's going to be a retreat place. Mm -hmm. um, talking about where I spend most of our time, it, it, you know, this little corner of the house, the deck, obviously, near the kitchen, off the river. Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, don't know the history, except we were talking about how we had heard that there was chemicals used. It was big ag at some point. So um, a ranch, reed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cindy, do you want to fill that in a little bit for everyone to know? Right, yeah, this, the field has been conventionally farmed for decades. And it's alfalfa. Okay. And it's right, currently it's an alfalfa, it's been an alfalfa for, for two years. Um, and so uh, it would have fertilizer uh, about two years ago. Okay. And then before that, whatever is normal for this alfalfa. Probably wheat and barley. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah wheat and barley. And so everything surrounding the property is, both properties essentially, is sprayed. Right. Was sprayed. Right. Well, this property is no longer sprayed, but the stuff that surrounds, adjacent to the properties, mm -hmm. is being sprayed, is still being sprayed. Right. Right. Okay. Um, the only other thing that occurred to us that I think is worth mentioning is um, what affects issues for this site could be the water bottling plant uh, and the river, you know, the plastics going into the river. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, um, that's huge, you know, and, and we're going to talk about zones here in a minute, and even people have developed almost a zone six right, where it is your neighbors and everything else that's coming that you can't, you can anticipate some of it, but you can't control it necessarily. Well, you're trying, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Question? Uh, what do you mean by the plastics going in? I mean, would the water bottling plant be disposing of plastics? Um, my, my understanding is that they are going to be rinsing the brand new bottles before they fill them with the, the water, the artesian water, oh, okay. and they're going to be rinsing them, which means there's going to be chemicals in those bottles because they were manufactured sure. using they're chemicals, and they're going to dump it in the river. Right. Okay. And there's all kinds mm -hmm. of cred. Right. And they swear it up with the water bottles that are bought are never drank. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, Very true. Yeah. 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 Oh, cool. So, and the other big, um, just for the natural disaster, um, yeah. I think blood is our risk here. Right. Well, and hail, of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere in Montana, hail. Um, great. So, continue to look at those questions, and as you move along the site tomorrow, tomorrow morning, if you take a walk before breakfast or, or whatever, just have those in your head, and Sunday we'll get more uh, in detail about more of the specifics there. So I, I know we're kind of running late. My group norm of being on time is, is already um, breaking down. But I wanted to um, talk just a little bit about zone and sector analysis in permaculture, because that is kind of one of the fundamentals of how you start to map. So you have a base map of your site, right? You're making observations of your site. And then another way that you're going to start to place things on your site is this whole idea of zone and sector analysis. So 
That is that you want to know, of course, the solar orientation, wind, the storm sectors, view sectors, fire sectors, and wildlife sectors on your sites. If your house is right here, you want to get a sense of very much what we were doing in the observation th um, piece. Where's the summer sun sector on your site? Right, so if this is north, this is your summer sun on your site. You know, sun comes up in the east here, and then in the summertime sets in the west over there. This is your winter sector is a lot smaller. So you know that, you know, ideal garden spot would be right here, you know, if there was nothing else in the way, of course, right? So that's your solar orientation. Then you want to know where your prevailing winds are coming from. So they're probably going to be, well, at this site, they're southwest, right? I think we should probably, so this is your wind here. And on your handouts, there's a page that kind of goes over these sectors that's drawn much better than mine. Page six. So wind sector, your view sector. You're also going to want to know, you know, on your site, are there views that you want to cut, that, that you want privacy? Are there views that you don't want to, um, that you don't that you don't want to uh, block. So a lot of that is about we don't want to block that view, you know. But we might want to, you know. For example, on my property, we have a really busy road on our front that's on our front yard. So we want to plant something there, likely, right, to block that view. So you want to have, you know, maybe this is a so that's east, right? So this is the good view. And say, I mean, there, there's not really a view here that you, don't, you want to block, right? But if you wanted to block a view, there's maybe another view over here that you'd want to block, right? Fire sector, especially if in, you're in an area where you have or you're in a remote area or backed up against a national forest or whatever, you want to know where the fires are coming from, right? Because you want to plan for that as well. You might have to do some thinning on your site. Um, wildlife sector. The wildlife sector in Montana is this entire <laughs> thing, right? So that is, you know, there are books, if you read Gaia's Garden, which is a great, like, first introduction to permaculture, they have, Toby Hemingway, who I love, um, but he has this thing of, oh, you can plant some stuff over here. We planted some stuff over here for the deer so that they went around our garden. That doesn't work in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> that will not work in Montana. You have to put up a fence up. You know, that's all great when there's not a huge amount of wildlife pressure. But, and in certain places, for example, I was at a client's and because they are between a really busy highway and a road, the deer just don't come into that area. They don't have that wildlife corridor, even though there are deer everywhere else, right? So it could be that you are on a site where that doesn't happen, but chances are if you have any kind of acreage, your wildlife sector is this entire thing. So that also determines where and how you design, right? How big a fence do you want? Do you want to fence your entire property? Do you just want to fence a, a portion of property? So when we move to the site, because our vision and our goals are a cold climate permaculture demonstration site, we fenced almost the entire three-quarter acre property, right? knowing that I'm not going to put in the time and the effort and the money, sweat equity, into this only to be like, here's a buffet for the deer, right? So it depends on your goals for your site. It gets back to that in terms of how much you want to fence. Depends on your budget, depends on your time. So all of these things, you can see a lot of times people are like, well, I have a totally blank slate. It's completely blank. It's completely flat. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. But when you start to look at the solar orientation, the wind, the storm sectors, the wildlife sector, that starts to limit your design. So if the wind is coming from this direction, do you want to put a windbreak in this area? Or do you want it so to channel that energy away? Or do you want to put a wind turbine to use that energy? So those are the types of things that you want to start to think about do you want to, you know, you obviously want to put most of your growing space 
in the, su the sun sector. But the sectors start to inform your design, so you never have a blank slate because there are external energies coming onto your property that inform how you design that property. So then overlaid onto that, so here's that same thing. Oh, and another thing is pollution. Another thing in this case is chemicals. So is there something that you're going to plant? For example, on our property, I had this idea, right, when we moved, before I knew a lot and was observing, I was like, oh, I'm going to plant a bunch of grapes along our west fence line. Well, we don't own the, the, the property between our fence line and the sidewalk. There's a patch of grass there that we don't own. It's owned by the HOA that's in back of us, and they spray right there. OK, I'm not going to grow grapes there. You know, so again, those are, the, those are the things that are going to inform your design. So instead, I'm going to grow, I'm growing honeysuckle and hops along there, things that we're not going to eat. And I have grapes on another part of our fence that's next to our driveway where they don't spray. And then that driveway is a heat sink, and it provides a microclimate for those grapes. Well, you should actually have, with all the aerial spraying going on here, you actually should have you know, you know, chemical sector, which is over in that field over there. You should have a chemical well, sector. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, the chemical sector is, what is it, to the... On the, on the other side of that road, so yeah. basically it's over there. Yeah. In. Yeah. And so is that, do you have experience with that, Jerome, in terms of what would you plant? Well, really along not, there? not a lot you can do about that. Yeah. You just have to be aware of it, and yeah. that's where it's at. Yeah. If you do when they were spraying, you'd stay inside or whatever, you know. So yeah. That's, I mean, there, there are ways of, you know, there are ways of uh, mitigating that uh, with, with, you know, shelter belts and stuff. There would be some less drift coming in. Right. If you could do some shelter belts, but that would take years, but whatever. Yeah. Considering what's going on there. But, but that's something to work towards, potentially, but also something to be aware or of. You, or you talk to your neighbors into Organic, right, right, right. 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 That. <laughs> the genetic drift. Well, that? yeah. So that's uh, so there was this case in Saskatchewan, wasn't it? Percy Schmeiser, where um, he wasn't growing genetically modified canola, but next door they were, and so Monsanto. Uh, sued him because he had like he wasn't growing it there but it came onto his property so that's if you're concerned about GMOs you know and and other things coming onto your property or for example we get a lot of in my food forest there's all sorts of asters that just blew in which is fine because they're asters and they're great late season forage but and so I don't mind that that's come into my system but that's just you know, things blow into the system. And so to understand, and especially if, if you are in a situation where you're farming and you're farming organically, and it's certified organic, you really do have to be concerned about if there's pe people around that are farming GMO crops or whatever, that's a big concern. Thanks, that's a good question. So, and then just in terms of sector planning, you, you want to use gravity to its maximum capacity, right? You want to store water high so that you can gravity feed the water below rather than having to pump the water up to, to irrigate, if you can do these. Mulch and other materials, it's much easier to push a wheelbarrow full of mulch or manure downhill than it is to push it uphill. So think about that if you have a lot of slope on your property and know the cold, cold air sinks. Right? So you don't necessarily want to put a garden in a cold sink because you're going to frost earlier. And then you're placing those elements so they face the sun or shade side depending on what you want to have happen. So that's sector planning. And then zones is this understanding that we maintain for and care for what we see on a daily basis, right? So you, in fact, ideally, you're putting 
stuff that needs your daily use and maintenance, your herbs, your kitchen garden, your compost pile, your greenhouse, close to your house. Close in, as close as you can get it. Because oftentimes people like to put their garden really far away and their compost, they're like, oh, it stinks, da la la. But then you're not going to go there as often. It's a big pain in the butt to walk 100, 150 feet to go maintain things. So you want to put your herbs that you use in your daily cooking, your lettuce, your tomatoes, your peppers, things that in this cold climate, you got to make sure that you keep an eye on. You might have to cover them with a frost cloth. Any of those things, you want those close in to your house. And then things that take your weekly use and maintenance, they can be further out. So those can be the winter and storage crops. So winter squash, onions, carrots, potatoes, things that can be on irrigation, but you don't have to work, look at every day, right? So they, have, they take the entire growing season to grow. And then they don't, and then you don't usually harvest them once, right? And then your food forest can be further out there. You don't have to look at that on a regular basis. And then zone three, if you're getting into acreage, is where you have your grazing animals, your forage crops, your larger ponds. And again, can somebody tell me, this is page four on your handouts. Zone four is farm forestry. So if we are intending to grow more of our own energy and provide more of our own energy, this is if we're off grid, right? So Jane, do you, do you have a wood stove or how do you heat? Wood stove. Right. So where do you get your wood from? Uh, the property and forest services. <coughs> right. Right. So having that in mind too, some people are, you already have larger trees or you have prunings that you can use for that wood or you're actually growing timber crops for that purpose long term. And then finally, zone five is wilderness area. So that, that area is that area of your property that you don't have to, you're not maintaining it, you're not manipulating in any way. That's wilderness area where we go to recharge, where we go to understand natural systems more. Uh, and usually the recommendation, of course, is that this is the biggest area of your property. So a lot of people, when they have like 20 acres, Oh my gosh, I have 20 acres, what am I going to do with it? Well, most of it, I'd recommend you do nothing. It's likely, in Montana, it's likely a wildlife corridor. So you may only develop two of those acres or three of those acres. For Again, depends on your goals for your property. But if it's a homestead for you and your family, you don't need more than two acres to do and provide for all of your needs, and the rest can be wildlife. Especially here, where we are kind of cognizant of grizzlies moving through here, deer, elk, whatever, you want to maintain those systems as well and be a part of that, um, that ecosystem. And like I said, some people now have said, okay, well, then your zone six are your neighbors and all the unanticipated things that are coming from off site that might come onto your site. That neighborhood dog who comes and kills all of your chickens. You know, those types of things, you would just want to be aware of those things. So what ends up happening is, this is just another way of looking at it. We kind of represent it in permaculture as a concentric, but it's not necessarily that way, right? Like right now, although that's not Cindy's and Steve's property, but you know, it's right next to it, that's zone five wilderness, even though it's right next to the house or that hedge, that Cyperian pea shrub hedge that you might have on your property or that lilac hedge, that's zone five because that's just wildlife habitat where you're not doing anything to it. You might prune it occasionally, but even that you might not do or that those ash trees or the ponderosa pine, that's what those are. Would you consider the alfalfa field uh, zone five if it just was left in alfalfa and not harvested, or would it be a whole process of trying to transition it, and then you'd have like a huge amount of weeds you'd have to deal with, that, you know, because it's been yeah. cultivated? Or That's a good question. I mean, that used to be probably zone three grazing, right, or, could, could, or farming area. I don't know. How would you consider that, well, Jerome? Well, right now it's wildlife. Yeah. Until they 
have a plan on what they want to do with it, uh, but it also could be baled for mulch. Mm -hmm. and there's, there's, there, they can't find anybody to cut it, so they've been cutting small amounts of it, but it could be a fodder crop, you know, for mulch. And it's valuable if you could cut all that and you could use it for mulching a lot of areas that you're, mulch is expensive, but alfalfa mulch is the best that you can find. If you, you, know, you can cut it on your own land. But um, that, that area may never be developed, you know, because of what they want to do here is a retreat center that might just be open space or, the, or it could be some alley cropping thing down the road. And that's to be determined, I guess, but right now it's just wildlife. So it could, yeah, I think that that's a, that's a really good question. And I think that's also a question for this site. You know, it's a huge swath of property. Do you continue to use it and have it be organic alfalfa because it's such a resource in terms of biomass? We'll talk about that too. You know, if you're trying to create these closed loop systems here, they're just naturally growing this biomass that can be used to establish other systems. We're talk about doing alternate grains. So that could be an area where they could do some strip cropping of alternate grains, and, you know, because it's being prepped now with alfalfa, so that could be the next succession. It's, it's really up to Cindy and what she wants to do and where her resources are and <coughs> how the design goes. So this is just another way to look at this. So here you have the house, you know, this is the ideal permaculture system. You know, the house is here, the herb and kitchen gardens are here, the food forest is here. In in cold climates, I'd say that the chickens move to the zone one. I mean, there's things that you um, need to maintain on a daily basis, and especially in the wintertime, you want them pretty close in because you're going out there in minus 20 degree weather. Um, and then it extends out into this whole zone system. So this is just another way to look at it. And as you go out, the intensity of use decreases. Right? The frequency of use decreases as well. Is this making sense? So on this pro so this is the property. This is kind of hard to see on here, but the little ho the house is here. So we're thinking, okay, if we do want to have production, you know, are we going to have it right up in up close in this space? If the sun allows for that, if the wind allows for it, if the wildlife all of that kind of allows for it, that would be a better area because you'd be more apt to maintain it closer in. And that's kind of what Cindy has done. We'll visit their site tomorrow. And that's what Cindy kind of moved. You used to do a lot of your production over here, right? And then you moved it closer in to the house right here, just to make it easier to, to maintain. So um, let's, it's late. I think we'll, there is another exercise that, that is, we'll probably find a time for it tomorrow or it's not that important to um, cover it right now. But that's, um, that's what I wanted to cover in this session for the most part. Are there any questions? A question about the food forest. Yeah. Living in Montana. Yes. Do you have to keep it all fenced as well? I mean, can you do something in a wild forest and add food? In there as well. It would be hard to do that and have it be survive. survive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be better, you know, back to your goals depending on what you want to do, but it would be hard to do that and not have it. I mean, you could fence, individually fence each of them, um, but that takes a lot of maintenance and yeah, yeah. You can, you know, in, in these. Uh, Evergreens is more difficult because you, you've got light considerations, but say if you had a scrub oak forest, you can thin some of that. And I, I grow, in my forest garden, I have nankeen cherries growing under scrub oak. Oh. And naturalized, um, they're great. So different ecosystems, you can thin out, open up, create a savanna. Right. And then you can grow things on the edges of that. Okay. But, you know, these forests are really difficult because, you know, they're, very acidic they're and big and they're tall and they're, you know, the pine needles are, you know, um, you know allopathic. So it's a little, bit along the edges you could do, you know, a lot of wild things, currants and gooseberries, nankeen cherries, 
uh, and you share that with a deer. Yeah. And, you know, and, and a wildlife. And one of the things we talk about, <clears throat> we have a pack with, after 45 years, we have a pack with, with, with wildlife. Mm. Even we're starting to get a pack with the bears this year. Mm. Uh, there's this, this, this ambiance that's been, uh, and other, other people have talked about this. Joe Salatin has, he has like 30 acres of, of what's out there. And he doesn't have a lot of wildlife uh, pressure on his agricultural. And I don't have a lot of wildlife for pressure on my one acre of forest garden. I have eight acres of pinion and juniper. I have an acre of swales mm -hmm. that I give to the wildlife. Mm -hmm. And they they hang up there, the deer hang up there, the turkey hang up there. I get a turkey license this year. I, I got a turkey. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's uphill, and I'm hoping I get a deer license. I can drag the deer down. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, on the so, you know, it's like, and if they don't come into my forest garden, they don't even, I haven't trained the bears well enough yet, but they're starting to get to where they're not breaking major trees. We, we dance with them all during harvest season. We have to pick the fruit, you know, the day it needs to be picked, not the day after. Right. It's like the raccoons. They know exactly, you know, you come in and get all your corn. If you get it just the day before, you may lose a branch, but you won't lose the whole tree. We have herds of elk coming through our property. Pardon? We have herds of elk coming through our property, so they would just... Well, those, those are pretty hard to manage. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Again, but it's... I know over... It takes a while, and, and it's not going to work everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like... You know, you know, here, you're just going to have to fence it. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, in certain areas. Of, but it's... My, my situation is completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. I have less wildlife. And uh, they have a you know, huge amount of area to roam because it's, uh, my mountain is pretty much undeveloped in the Juniper well, most of the lower areas. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk about that tomorrow on the forest garden. Cool. cool. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's let's end the session.